in our university. Thank you. <laughs> I usually call the Zoom person Wanda when I get a message from her. Thank you, Wanda. <laughs> and um, this is my 12th year in Iowa State, and I have been teaching one class, one of the classes that I teach since the first year of my tenure here in, um, in Iowa State as consumer behavior in apparel. Um, so I've been teaching it for a, a, a while, and this class happened, this course happened to be my favorite um, course when I was an undergrad. So I am very excited that I'm able to share my experience today. And um, I wouldn't say my um, experience of adapting this OER is very unique, but I hope my humble experience will, will give you some um, inspirations and hopefully my experience will be helpful for you. So I'm going to share my screen with my slides. You see, oh, okay, there we go. All right, so my topic is standing on shoulders of giants. And I, I know this seems a little bit cliche, but this is really what I thought when I look at all the, all the OERs. When you think about textbooks or any teaching materials, we're probably not creating any knowledge, right? We are gathering knowledge that are established by researchers or previous, um, previous scholars, right? So I really feel that creating a, a materials, especially in a format that is similar to a traditional textbook in a loser that's definition, I think we're standing on the shoulders of giants. So um, here's my agenda today. I'm going to talk a little bit of the background of my project. Um, so you know where I came from. Um, and then I'm going to share the steps for me to adapt this OER. For me, this is a uh, this this is a process that involved multiple steps and involved multiple years. Um, and then some tips and lessons that I learned from my experience. And please, if you have any questions, just stop me anytime. Or if you would like to um, share that at the end of my presentation, that would be great as well. Okay, so for me, after this whole process, I think I can share as a nutshell for me, um, adapting an OER is like when you buy uh, purchase a house, right? Especially when you visit the the house that the potential house that you are going to purchase. You'll walk into it and you'll feel, wow, this is a good environment. Um, and and you are still you are starting to imagine how you are going to your your life in that new house, right? And then um, you might have some ideas of remodeling it. So. Um, Sometimes it takes a little bit of imagination to see the life that you're going to have in that new house and imagination to envision where you're going to put your stuff or how you're going to remodel that. So for me, adapting this experience of adapting this OER is just like remodeling a house. So you, it, it's already a, a beautiful house a sound structure. Um, I could see myself living in it, but I think there are things that I could adjust to fit my lifestyle better. Um, so the background of my project is, like I said in the beginning, uh, I teach consumer behavior in apparel. Um, a few years ago, the course title is changed to consumer studies in fashion products, but in, in a in a sense, it's consumer behavior. Um, so I began with, um, I began teaching this course with um, the textbook on the left side, Consumer Behavior, and that is the textbook I used when I was in undergrad. Um, Dr. Solomon is a, is a prestigious scholar in this area, um, and this textbook is, is great. Um, however, there are two things about it. First is that it's very expensive, right? Um, it costs about $100 for, for, for 
to buy an, uh, a, a brand new um, paperback version of it. Um, the second is that it is consumer behavior addressing a general uh, business, general consumers. Um, but I teach in consumer behavior in apparel, right? Um, so I want something that is specifically for fashion students. So I switch to the um, textbook in the middle. So it is called Consumer Behavior in Fashion. It sounds perfect to me, right? And it is written by Dr. Solomon and Dr. Rabot. Um, they they co-authored this book to um, Dr. Nancy Rabot is 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 well known scholar in uh, fashion fields, and with her co-authorship, um, this textbook is fantastic in terms of adding the aspect of fashion dress um, appearance in consumer behavior. However, um, there are two things about this textbook. First one. It is still very ex expensive. I think um, to buy a brand new one is about like $80. The second is that it has been stopped. Um, it has stopped being um, updated. So I think the, the newest version was the second edition and it hasn't been updated for, for a decade. So it doesn't fit my need. Um, then the third textbook I use is by, um, by Sergi et al. And it is published by Flat World. If you know about Flat World Publishing, um, it is a online publisher. And it, its goal was to uh, make textbooks more, um, <laughs> more affordable. So, um, so it's a it's a platform with digital textbooks with more affordable prices. So I think with this version, um, if students want a online only version of this textbook, um, they only need to pay about $30. Two things happened. First, they stopped updating that and the publishers, um, the, um, the publisher decided that they are going to um, take it down from the shelf. And again, um, it doesn't have any um, specific content related to fashion or apparel. So um, my search for, my journey for OER started from there because the consumer behavior today book from Flat World has been taken down from the shelf. I had a urgent need to find a new um, textbook. And I would like this new textbook to be able to address to our fashion students because consumers' decisions related to their appearances and their dressing are largely influenced by their identity, their cultural and their culture and the social environments. So the studies of consumer behavior in the fashion or apparel fields really need to be reflected and emphasized in specific areas. Um, so here are my steps to that 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 um, I I took to begin this journey. So back in spring 2022, that was the time that I I, I was informed that I um, the textbook I used to use is going to be um, taken down from the shelf. So uh, the course that I teach is going to be offered in fall. Usually, is offered in fall. So um, I think it was around like uh, May or April, I was informed and I, I thought that, oh, I, I really need to find the right book this time. Um, so I started searching and um, I had searched for OER before, but I never seen any book that addressed consumer behavior. But this time I decided that I'm going to reach out to ISU library and um, I reached out to Abby and with Abby's assistance, um, I was able to locate this book, um, um, this open educational resource focusing on consumer behavior. Um, and then in 2000, 2022 fall, that is the time that I teach with this OER. Um, um, and during the fall semester, um, it really helped me to identify any missing content that I wish there is, um, but not in the book. So 
um, this past spring um, in in 2023, I started to think that I'm going to to adapt this book into something that will have some content I need. So I started with the blueprint and then I create the content and then I teach uh, fall 2023. This semester is the time the first time I teach with this adapted version. So I'm going to get a little bit more into the steps. So first, during the spring 2022, um, it's really straightforward um, to for me to to just reach out to Abby. <laughs> Um, in in Iowa State's um, library website, we have a whole section um, dedicating to open educational resources. So I just look um, and there are resources for me to search for myself by myself. And also there is a little line saying that you can reach out to our experts. And so I reached out. Um, and I'm, I'm sure in, in Iowa, you probably have the same kind of page um, in your website, but I, on your website, but I, I just never checked. Um, so this is probably the easiest part for me. So Abby helped me to identify this book um, that is possibly something that I could use. I look at it, I evaluate it. I thought, well, although there are some things that I wish there there, there is, um, I, I think this is a it good enough um, content for my class. Of course, this this book is perfect on its own. I think um, Professor Neil C is uh, the 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 author of the book. Um, collaborated with her students to create some of the content, and of course, she she um, outlines the topics very well in a very logical sense. So, um, in the fall, I began to adapt it. Um, so. In between spring and fall, this is really the time that I change all my teaching materials, my slides, my quizzes, and my um, exams and my activities according to this book, right? Um, so um, while I'm preparing that, I started to realize that, first of all, um, not only that there are some content that I wish there is that focus on fashion, but also, um, I want the order of the topics or the chapters um, to follow my logic that I feel most reasonable for my students, right? So you can see this is a excerpt from my um, <laughs> my um, syllabus, and this is the schedule in the syllabus. In week seven, you can see that I have topic six, consumer motivation, involvement, and I have a parenthesis saying that this is the part three from your textbook. And in um, in week eight, I have topic seven, and this is topic, and this is going to be from the textbook part four. So when students are navigating through the semester, they'll have to jump between the chapters a little bit in the textbook in order to be able to get the topics um, according to the order I have on the syllabus. So um, it wasn't ideal, but I think my students were troopers. So they, they lived with it and learned from that. And I think they're um, amazing. But that is also a chance for me to identify how I'm going to change or adapt this book. So in spring, this is a time that I really sit down and reflect on my experience from fall thinking, uh, what can I change? How can I move? So on the left, I have a table that lists out the um, topics. It's basically the table of content from Neil Z's book. Um, so she had uh, several parts and each part she had different chapters. And on the right-hand side, I have a column um, noting how I'm going to use these content. So for example, in chapter two, I would like to just adopt it. Um, chapter three, I would like to supplement it with my own content. Um, so uh, that is based on the book. And then I wanted to change the, the, the titles. I, I want to change the, the order of the chapters, right? So on the right-hand side, you can see that I created this table that had the topics and the orders that I wanted. 
and I um, know that the content I wanted in this newly um, adapted version. So topic one um, is really something that I couldn't find from Neil's version. So I know that this is going to be new content and I have outlined what I wanted to include in the new content. Um, topic two, I think it is going to be from Neil's original content, but I wanted to move chapter 29 and 20, um, 29 and 30 up to topic two, and I'm going to supplement. Um, topic three, again, is a brand new chapter for me. So I added what I wanted. And topic four is going to be from Neil C. And I moved several different um, chapters from her book to this topic and I supplement. So this is how I built my blueprint um, to be able to see what I wanted from the original um, table of content and how I would like to build a new table of content. And this is really how I follow, uh, what I follow when I started to create the content. Um, creating a content is pretty straightforward. <laughs> I do not like writing. <laughs> um, writing is probably a, 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 a very big chunk of my career, right? It's, it's something required for our jobs, but um, I, I never liked writing. But I think it is the most, um, the second most straightforward part in this process is just to get gather the um, literature, uh, follow my outlines and just write the content. Um, but with the, with, with this step, with spring, summer, 2023, I wanted to create a new content first and I wanted to move the chapters first. So when my students um, use this textbook in fall, 2023, they do not need to jump between the chapters to follow the order I want. And um, they do not need to um, look at a handout for the new content I wanted to add. So that, that was my goal. So in um, summer 2023, I created the new chapters. I moved the chapters and um, fall 2023, this semester is really the time that I teach uh, with the adaptive version of this book. So um, while I teach, you can see that I no longer have the parentheses denoting which chapters they are going to get this topic from. So um, I think that is very helpful for students um, that they could just follow along. Um, but while I'm teaching, I, I, I also identify some content that I would like to fine tune. Um, like I said, um, consumer behavior in fashion re it, um, requires some specific uh, perspectives, right? Um, we, we would like students to think a little bit more about how people use appearance to express identity and how that is how that process can be uh, it, it involves the negotiation with the social identity or the larger social environment. So I would like to incorporate some more fashion related um, examples in the book. So while I teach, I identify the examples or um, the activities that Neil C. Original had in her book. And I um, created another table of the content that I would like to swap out to fine tune while I teach as well. And I will also like to identify some interactive components to add. Um, interactive components are something like this one. Um, I think this is a, um, I think this is more like a flash card for students to um, to remember or to memorize. I didn't like to use this word to memorize the definition of a few concepts. And this is one of the interactive component from Neil C's original content. Um, and the thing that I, I like this component is that it's interactive. So students could click on that and show the um, answers. And this is powered by H5P. And from what I knew, it's a built-in function in digital press. Um, and our university had that subscription. So I could just create the interactive uh, component and add to my 
um, OER, the adapted OER. So things that I am thinking about adding would be a quick quizzes, um, of course, not graded, the self-paced quizzes or a small matching games for them to, um, um, to play around when they are exploring the content in the in the textbook. And I would also like to swap out some activities in the book and some uh, videos in the book. Um, and um, my goal is really to be able to um, create all the supplementary content in spring 2024 and to identify and swap out some of the examples that are not focusing on apparel or fashion in spring. So when I teach again in fall, I have more interactive content in this book and I have more fashion, um, fashion focused um, content as well. So that is my whole process for creating or adapting this new um, OER. Um, it, it's a journey that hasn't ended yet. And I think this is really something that I will keep building um, as, as I teach this course. Every year I find there are something interesting. Um, I borrow something from my students' perspective thinking I could add that to my to my lecture or my um, class activities. So I think this is a continuing uh, journey. Some tips and lessons that I, um, I got from this journey is that reach out to your library experts. Um, I searched for OER myself, by myself, <laughs> um, probably before 2022, I can't remember which year. And I, I thought I am pretty good at searching things, you know, <laughs> being able to search articles online, being able to search resources online. I thought I would be able to identify the OER for me to adapt pretty easily, but I, it, it, I, I couldn't. So um, I was very glad that I'm still very glad that I reach out to our library experts. They know a lot, not only about the sources you could search, but also some other media formats or some other types of materials you can use as OERs. So um, I, I think this experience really opened my eyes about what can serve as OER and how you could package them into a course package, digital course package for your students. Right? So um, I think this is a great partnership to establish early on when you are starting thinking about um, creating your own OER or adapting something. Um, and the second lesson I have learned is that if you build it, they will not necessarily come, uh, unlike Field of Dreams. So um, I have this OER and I was very excited about it. And I, I told my students that I am still, um, I'm still adapting it. I'm still adding content to this resource at the beginning of the semester. But I, I, I reminded them that um, a lot of the class activities are related to the content of the textbook. Um, however, I, I haven't checked the backstage um, stats, but just by my with my from the conversation I have with my students, I feel they only read it when they need to take the quizzes. So, um, for, which is kind of frustrating to me. But then I realized um, during the class or when they have to get content um, to help them say, do their projects, they usually refer to my slides instead of the book or the OER. So I realized, oh, maybe I should have tied the book better into uh, my Canvas site. And maybe I need to reduce down how they rely on these slides, right? I think the slides are helpful for them to follow along or take notes when they are um, discussing a top topic in the class, right? However, I think if they rely too much on the slides, um, it wouldn't get them the depth of knowledge, right? Because um, slides are used for, for the class time and I don't cover everything in the slides, right? Um, so 
I, I, that's something that I learned this semester. And I think I'll have to find a way that to, to reduce the reliance on the slides for them. Yes, I agree. It's always a challenge to get students um, to read. Um, and then the third lesson I learned is to be open-minded and be agile. So um, to be open-minded is that when I learned that students are not using this wonderful, fantastic OER that I ad adapted, um, of course, I feel frustrated. But then I, I thought that this is Gen Z. They don't they don't have the same behavioral patterns as previous generations. And each generations are different, right? And this is probably not only about generations, but also about how digital format of digital media change everybody's behavior. So um, this is something I learned. And I think um, with this experience, I, I become more open-minded with um, different formats of media to be included in the OER and how I could integrate the OER into some other media or devices students are going to use. For example, I know students look at Canvas a lot, but um, although my OER is a tab in my Canvas, probably not, that is not enough. Maybe I need to build that into modules, right? So when they are following each topic on the modules, they are able to also see, oh, here's a chapter. I need to read that instead of the slides. Um, and be agile is that um, you can change content on the platform pretty easily. Um, and I think um, throughout the semester, that I found students are uh, probably more interested in, in seeing more videos or video examples of some of the um, content or concept we talk about. I could add that into the OER during the semester. Um, I used to add them all on Canvas because I, I thought that that was intuitive for me, right? Um, I just upload or I just add a link on my Canvas module that that seemed pretty intuitive to me. But I think uh, one way to, to encourage them or make it easier for them to see the examples while they are reading the book um, is to build different media into the book for them. But of course, um, you might have a very different experience and you might need to be agile in other ways. Um, so that concludes my... Um, presentation or sharing of my experience. I think overall, um, this experience of moving into a new house, imagine myself, um, imagine myself into this in this new house with my new life is wonderful. Um, and I get to be creative. Um, but sometimes just like any remodeling, there are there is a period of time that you have it, it's painful for for the instructor because I have to move things around I have to build things while I go um, so I would say doing so while I teach the same course can be a little bit stressful but the fun part is that I get to be creative and I get to uh, build upon a, a very sound structure and very well written content already um, so that is all from me. Um, I have my email here and this QR code will lead to my ISU profile, which will have my, um, my email address as well. Um, is there any um, questions or any experiences you would like to share? You can feel free to type any questions that you have into the into the chat, or you can just unmute your mics if you have questions too. Oh, we have a, a question in the chat from Abby, it looks like. If you don't mind sharing, how long did it take to build your blueprint for adapting the OER for your needs? Um, how long did it take? Um, to to really write it out, I think I it took me like a um two full days to really sit down and and um type it out and kind of compare them. But I wouldn't be able to sit down and compare it and type it out 
if I did not teach with a with the original OER the previous semester, because that experience really helped me to identify how I want um, the content to be changed. Yeah, that's a really interesting. Um, I have not really encountered other adapters before who have taught with the book as is first. And I think that's really an interesting way to approach it and probably gives you a really good idea of the strengths and weaknesses of that book before before adapting. Um, I had just a quick piggyback off of Abby's question about sort of the nuts and bolts of the adaptation process. So um, once you had the original book, did you sort of import it into Pressbooks and then do your editing there? Or did you kind of compile all your edits in Word first and then import to Pressbooks? Or could you speak just a little bit about kind of the, the nitty gritty of the, of the adaptation process? Sure, of, um, of course, I'll be happy to share. Um, so I, with the new content and the supplementary content, I have Word files first. I um, And I feel that is just how I like, um, because that will allow me to send it to a copy editor to edit, or I could um, mark up areas that I want to add interactive content in that way. And I always have a copy on my computer. I I don't know, that made me feel safer, more secure. So um, I, I write out all the content on um, in Word first, and then um, I copy and paste them onto the digital press platform. Great, great. Yeah, I think a lot of our authors at Iowa do that too, like start in Word and then end up copying and pasting into press books. It looks like we have another question from Sarah Hickson. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chung. I wonder, I feel hesitant to include assignments in OER. Do you experience that at all? Yeah, I do not include assignments on in OER myself. I know some of my colleagues did. Um, and the reason that I did not want to include assignments in OER is just because um, I want the assignments to be on Canvas so I could include the rubrics and I could grade there. Um, and that allowed me some, um, some flexibility to change the content on Canvas um, year by year. Uh, with OER, I hope I do not need to um, say change the due date on, on the textbook, right? So um, I, I kept it off Oh, the OER um, and embedded on can Canvas. But um, I think um, there are already some in-class activities in the textbook. And I am going to add my own in-class activities in the OER just for the merit of sharing the activities that could go with the textbook. Um, for some other instructors, when they are thinking about adapting this book or adopting this book, they can use some. You're welcome. I know we see that handled a lot of different ways. Sometimes people will submit the assignments, but we'll have it sort of locked down and then have instructors email them with the, you know to get access to the assignments just because they don't want students having access to those, especially the answer keys, like, you know, in advance of taking the course. Um, others just have them, you know, open and included in, in the work, just kind of them. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any other questions? So it sounds like you had a pretty strong impression of the original textbook going into the project. Do you think, how, I guess, how important is that, do you think, to adapting an OER project? Do you, do you feel like you have to start with a pretty strong book? Or do you think the potential is there, even if the book is, say, only like 25% usable? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm pretty lucky to find this book. And, and I would say this is really the only book we could find that focus on consumer behavior. But I, I think we're, I, I'm very lucky to find this book that is, um, that is already uh, very well written and had a very sound structure for me to just follow or just switch the orders. Um, it definitely made the process a lot easier because um, as you can see, I built a blueprint basically based off the table of content from the original book, right? So I, I think that really helped me um, in the process, really make the process a lot easier. Um, but I think when 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 we are dealing with or where 
um, adapting or creating OER, um, even if you don't have a, a strong original content to build off from, um, I think it is still a very great way to include the um, content you want. Um, and it's still a very great starting point to create or adapt your own OER. Just think about that it's already, there's already a structure there. Um, I would like to think about that as fixer upper versus, <laughs> versus, oh, this is a great house. I just need to remodel it a little bit um, to fit my preferences. Um, I, and I think it's just a, a matter of the time needed to, to restructure it or to remodel it. Right. Very, yeah, that's very true. Abby says having a, even a skeleton to work from is better than starting from scratch. And I, I agree. And we've been really trying to push um, adaptation over creation locally with our program. But what we hear from authors a lot of the time is like, oh, I don't like that book. It's just, you know, that's not going to fit my needs. And I still think yeah. it's very well written. But I mean, you, I think, you know, that's a starting point for another conversation, I think, about how, you know, we can take these things apart and just because it, you're not satisfied with it in the current state doesn't mean it's not usable in some way. Yes, definitely. And I, I think having a skeleton or having a, a original book to adapt from really helped me reduce the anxiety of having to start from scratch. Um, when I think, and again, I did not like writing. <laughs> um, it's the, the least enjoyable part. Um, for my for my career <laughs> I like research but writing is really not my strength but um, so I think starting to write a textbook from scratch is really something that I, I feel uh, very challenging and I think that is a mental barrier for a lot of people when they start to think about OER is that I have to create something new from scratch. But I think adaptation is a, a way to, um, to overcome that barrier. Um, so at least if you have something, a skeleton, I think it's a great start. Great. All right, anybody else have any other questions or thoughts they'd like to share? Well, I would like to thank you, Dr. Chung, for joining us today and for sharing your um, your presentation and your thoughts on adapting to OER. Um, I look really forward to seeing the publication notice coming out and, and being able to take a look at the book. Um, for those of you who joined us today, thank you. And you can view uh, the recording on the Iowa OER YouTube channel probably within the next day or so. So again, if you have um, topics you'd like to see on these webinars, drop us a line and um, everybody have a great holiday. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.